Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. So I got to tell you, the most fascinating part about this uh, part-time gig I've got as your six o'clock every night uh, uh, radio uh, host is I meet some absolutely fascinating people. And I got to tell you, I've got one of those unbelievably fascinating people to introduce you to tonight. Neil Seaman is the founder uh, and chair of something called WRIWI Corp. He is a expert on predictive analytics and on the brain and on entre entrepreneurship. He writes and uh, he mentors. I think this will be an interesting uh, conversation. Uh, as well as being non-executive chairman of the company, he works on new product strategy, research and development, special projects for RIWI. Neil invented RIWI's core intellectual property. He is the author and co-author of hundreds of articles in major media around the world, more than 30 peer-reviewed journal papers and several books and monographs. Neil, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? I'm well, thank God. Thanks, Brian. Uh, really uh, great to be here uh, this evening and, and have some uh, discussion with you on, uh, yeah, prediction or, or, or its reverse. So tell us to, to start out, what, what, who is, what is RIWI? Yeah, it stands for Real-Time Interactive Worldwide Intelligence, uh, or we just call it RIWI. Um, it was a, a company, it's a technology company that measures what people think, feel, and need in every country in the world. Think, I invented it. Feel? Yeah. Yeah, feel, think, and, and need, right? Think, so, feel, and need. Yeah. Fascinating. How'd you I, get into that? So I, I was really frustrated with the limited uh, data uh, on opinions um, from very narrow audiences, especially in the context of public health. Uh, that's my area of background. My, my research background is actually the internet and public health. So during H1N1 um, and the Arab Spring in particular back in uh, 2011, uh, you know, it was really difficult using uh, online social media analytics to predict where things were going. And I wanted a new way of doing things. So I invented what's called random domain intercept technology, which re reaches a random universe of people in any web enabled region of the world and helps predict change. So we got on the map with having predicted the fall of uh, Mubarak in February 2011, um, and having done a lot of work on uh, the last uh, the last pandemic that we faced. How did you predict the fall of Mubarak? Yeah, that was sort of an accident. Um, a lot of things were accidental in the early stages of pre-commercialization. So we, um, I was just interested in a lot of things. Uh, and I was trying to understand the temperature of different um, countries in the Middle East on a variety of things, in, in, including attitudes toward authoritarian regimes. And what we did is we canvassed, we looked at 10,000 uh, mobile respondents uh, randomly across, across Egypt. And these are people who don't typically answer surveys, right? And uh, we, we found on um, just over the, really quickly, um, over the course of a few days, support for um, the Mubarak regime plummeted. Um, and, and that was just really illuminating to a variety of uh, public health security and security people around the world. Fascinating. So you're doing this with questions or polling or what? Yeah. So we 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 do it with questions. We have uh, we, we survey everywhere around the world on behalf of organizations like the the CDC uh, here in Ontario, the Science Advisory Table, um, the State Department, the United States, the United Nations, uh, the Gates Foundation, large humanitarian organizations that really need to understand uh, what we call peace technology um, and ground truth, public sentiment. So we also message test um, understanding sort of which messages resonate with uh, with uh, different people and, and how people react. That's really important in the context of COVID because we need to understand what makes people hesitate to get a vaccine. And it's such a diversity of reasons. Um, and, and uh, you know, this is what we do every day in any region of the world. And well, that sounds interesting. Now, for what, example, what, in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Why do people hesitate to get a vaccine? Yeah, so it's a it's a diversity of reasons, and at the beginning of the pandemic, it, it was sort of um, sort of simplified, right? Um, the, there was this sort of perspective that um, libertarian anti-government people were the only people who didn't get a vaccine, and then we actually found that it's complex and complex dynamic 
um, as my friend Diane Feingood at Simon Fraser University likes to say, right? Like it, it's that the, the, there's there's a wide range of reasons relating to healthcare literacy, um, relating to equity issues, access to information. Um, and, and oftentimes what we think and feel is so much affected by the people um, in whom we invest trust. And uh, people have a spectrum of trust uh, in terms of uh, in terms of who they they uh, they they respect and, and and take wisdom from, a spectrum of trust. My my sense a year ago was that uh, people's trust was huge with uh, Anthony Fauci, uh, but uh, that it's come down over time, um, and that people had this huge trust in scientists initially, but that of late it's almost fragmented, uh, such that people don't trust almost anybody. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm the I'm the son of two brain scientists. And uh, so I've always had tremendous respect for bench science and, and uh, the, the, work of, uh, the work of science. And at the beginning, right, the message, hey, trust the science, that, that worked for a lot of people. Um, but nowadays, um, our research is finding that it's, it's not only about the message, uh, but, but it's, it's also about the messenger, right? So different people respect different messengers. Um, and so you've got to think, think hard about that um, in this context. And uh, with information changing so quickly, um, it's really important to keep that uh, real-time uh, uh, barometer on, on whom people trust. We're chatting tonight with Neil Seaman. Uh, uh, he is the founder and chairman of ReY. Is that how you pronounce it? ReY? <laughs> so uh, uh, anything goes. Uh, Rewi, uh, R-I-W-I. Or, or W-I- R-I-W-I Corp. He's a predictive analytics expert. Uh, he's a mentor. He's an entrepreneur. Um, he's a brain expert. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with, uh, with Neil in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. As I mentioned uh, off the top, I get to meet some really interesting people, and hopefully uh, some of you that uh, listen to my shows get to meet them as well. And uh, Neil Seaman is, uh, Seaman is, uh, is one of those uh, gentlemen. Um, he's got just an unbelievably interesting uh, resume and background. Let me just, uh, off the top, tell you a little bit about him. He um, graduated uh, from Queen's University with a double major in uh, political science and English literature, political science and English literature. Then he went and did a, uh, a law degree at the University of Toronto with a health focus. He then went to Harvard University School of Public Health and got a master's in public health uh, and health management. Um, but I got it, you know, like it's interesting what people put on their resume and it's interesting what people's lives are all about. He shows on his, on his um, interests when he was doing a master's of public health at Harvard University that he was into poetry. Got to talk about that, Neil. That'll be interesting. Um, he was an articling student at Smith Lines. He was a founding editorial board member of the National Post. He was a counsel at the National Citizens Coalition. He was a pro bono uh, policy lawyer. He was a research fellow and program director and founder of the Fraser Institute. He was a consultant at Gerson Lehman Group. He was uh, research consulting with IBM Healthcare. He was an executive advisor and introducer at NGOs and Fortune 500. He was a founder of the Health Strategy Innovation Cell. He was a senior advisor at the Blackstone Law Group. He was a research associate at uh, University of Toronto, a senior fellow in the Institute of Health Policy. And today he's chairman and founder of RIWI uh, Corporation. What an incredibly impressive background you've got, sir. It's a circuitous, perhaps, <laughs> but it all aligns, it, it all aligns, Brian, to a, uh, a singular their path, right? I, I'm trying to figure out how the brain works. Um, I'm the son of two scientists. I'm not a scientist. I'm the son of two brain scientists. And in particular, um, I'm trying to understand how data um, can sometimes confuse us um, in, in terms of us making predictions, right? So Yogi Berra said prediction is, is uh, really hard, especially if it's about the future. I'm of the view that it's incredibly hard, even when it's about the present. And there's a lot of factors that are affecting my conclusion there. Um, you know, big data, which, you know, I, I, I work in that field and uh, I've long worked in that field. Big data was supposed to make us smarter, supposed to make us better predictors of things. Um, but in fact, 
I, I feel it's, it's, uh, it's confused us. It's made us more biased. Why are we drowning in the data? So what I'm learning is that in the context of, of COVID-19, I'm, I'm writing a book now about the brain and, and, and my father's work um, around dopamine and the brain and how it makes us work is that um, dopamine transmitters can often um, essentially tell us which memories and which observations we hold salient. And, and when we look at a topic like COVID-19 and we have such a surfeit, an avalanche of information that changes day by day, what it does is actually um, it, it hardens our ideologies. It hardens our positions because those dopamine receptors in your brain, um, they keep working and working and working to reinforce the attitudes and opinions that you had earlier. So it takes a great deal of intellectual courage to fight against your, your biases. Tell, tell us everyone, tell everyone, what is dopamine? So dopamine is a brain molecule. It was discovered by um, Catherine Montague in 1957 at Runwell Hospital outside London. Um, and it's right around the time they were trying to figure out um, why certain drugs um, were effective in treating psychosis. And then in the 1970s, my father, Philip Seaman, he died uh, about a year ago. Um, he uh, discovered these things in the brain called the dopamine receptors, first the, the D1, D2 receptors. Um, and, and what they do is they modulate the flow of, of this brain molecule. And depending on how fast uh, it flows, the spurts with which it flows, it can affect the pleasure. It's often called the, the, the pleasure receptor. Um, it can affect addiction and it can affect um, your observations um, and your biases. So I was understanding that, you know, things like uh, you've got mail or the ding of the, the telephone, uh, the, the, uh, the, the smartphone and things like that hit our dopamine receptors and get us addicted to things like that uh, or, um, you know, whatever else that we may be addicted to. Is, is that a correct analysis? Yeah. So they have found that there's a what's called dopaminergic response um, to social media. Um, and so it. it I feel it's kind of a, a symptomatic thing. So you can you can have addiction, and then you can also have that addictive um, activity on on social media. So there's certainly that. Um, but uh, so there's the reward principle, but there's also the risk principle too. So dopamine encourages us to take risk sometimes too, and that's the D4 receptor. And sometimes, so it's really about keeping that risk reward balance in check. Um, and, and that's, uh, that's how we, um, uh, that's how we can manage our, our dopamine response. The most intense, uh, dopamine rush, uh, my father taught me was, um, not, not from, um, that was even more than crack cocaine was, uh, is actually gambling. Gambling addiction is the most intense. And then it flows from there. Really? That's interesting. So, so I don't understand though. Why would, um, lots of information about COVID-19 impact our dopamine? Yeah, so the way it works, right, is that um, it's it, uh, dopamine coats uh, certain observations with uh, what's called salience, uh, what uh, that you attach um, meaning to, and you only attach meaning or dopamine salience to things that are personally rewarding to you. So if it's personally rewarding to you um, and validating to you um, to uh, sort of let's just say. Um, maintain schools um, open at, at all costs, you will sort of instinctively hold to that position. Um, and, and that thinking sort of pervades your cognitive bias throughout the course of, of, of gathering more information. So you'll selectively um, pull um, the information that helps reinforce that position. So it just takes a lot of effort. Hey, I'm not the only one to say this. Adam Grant has a great new book out called Think Again, which is really about questioning, um, you know, questioning your bias, being bias aware uh, constantly. Really, that's fascinating. So I had thought that, uh, you know, one of the major impacts in the last year had been uh, extreme partisanship and ideology and the fact that we're only listening to um, voices that we agree with these, this concept of the echo chambers, is that playing a role with this dopamine that you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it really is. And I got to tell you, I, I was somebody, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an internet 
champion. I, I in the early days of the commercial web, I loved everything about the web. And I, I actually did take seriously people, um, Cass Sunstein, others talking about the echo chamber of the web because I saw proliferation of media and I thought it would be great. But no, it has created this hyper-partisanship, which is driven uh, by this dopamine salience that keeps pushing at us through the algorithms uh, of, of various social media feeds. And it, it hastens um, sort of acrid and, and ferocious uh, debates online. So definitely, the, but, but the partisanship is driven by that, what I call that dopaminergic uh, response activity. So it's inherently human. Um, so we have to acknowledge that it is human, um, you know, uh, in the context of why we're doing it. Really, that's interesting. So it's inherently human. So it is natural for us to become wedded to our beliefs, wedded to our ideology, wedded to our previous st stands. Yeah. I mean, I can't remember if it was, was it Galbraith um, uh, who said, yeah, if you're, if you're, if you're not in the grips of any particular ideology, it's simply because you're not aware of it. Right. So um, even now when I'm speaking with you in the last 20 minutes, I have no doubt that a variety of, of cognitive biases uh, have, have crept into my mind. Um, you know, I'm making certain assumptions. I'm looking at you um, uh, and I'm making certain assumptions about you. Um, I used to be a kind of amateur boxer, actually. And I, I had this really fascinating experience when I would make these sort of quick associative judgments about people. Um, when when you step into the boxing match with them, um, you know, if someone's been uh, in the military, for example, you make certain assumptions about how they're going to fight. Um, so, yeah, it, it is interesting um, in terms of how it works on the brain. And I think we're just at the beginning of trying to understand that. It's really exciting. Fascinating. And so with this predictive analytics, uh, what are you trying to predict? Yeah, so I mean, with respect to our work uh, at Rewe, I mean, we're, do we're doing a lot of work on global public health. Um, is so naturally uh, understanding the course of the, the pandemic, understanding the course of, of people's uh, receptivity or willingness to support restrictions in different parts of the world. Uh, in the peace and security area, we're doing a lot. Um, we're very active in parts of the world like China, Afghanistan, Myanmar, um, understanding how, for example, the regime in Afghanistan has affected um, families with women and girls, women and girls specifically. Um, so a lot of humanitarian uh, response issues. We also work on behalf of large financial institutions that need to understand um, and get an information edge when trying to understand, for example, uh, momentum around Bitcoin or um, attitudes toward certain uh, asset classes. Um, fascinating. How, how do you monitor attitudes in Afghanistan? Yeah, so we have um, our technology reaches into any um, country or territory in the world, except for North Korea. Um, and so in Afghanistan, um, we have uh, rotating uh, lapsed dormant domains that people access on their web enabled phone and they're um, invited to participate in a privacy secure um, short survey or message test and no personal uh, identifying information is collected, and that's really important in the humanitarian sector. Um, and then that information is um, is uh, streamed in real time into our dashboard. So we're uh, continually understanding changes, inflection points, um, attitudes, uh, and impacts on critical infrastructure of uh, of the change of uh, a regime there. What what do you think the outcome of that is? What's your prediction for? Uh... Afghanistan, given what you know? Yeah, I mean, it's a systemic shock to the region, um, if if it and the world, if it wasn't for COVID um, and, and Delta at that time, uh, and everything that was preoccupying our country and all countries around the world, um, Afghanistan, in my view, um, would continue to be on the front page or or top line of, of websites and newspapers across the world in terms of its ricochet effects. Um, it, it's a humanitarian uh, crisis um, of, of very significant proportions. And I don't think, uh, I, I, think I, I think the various administrations around the world, they're aware of it. Um, it, it and and they're, they're, uh, they're just now we're, the next step is understanding how civil society groups can uh, work inside uh, Afghanistan safely um, to, to get to people um, in need. 
I'm you know far from an expert on Afghanistan, but but I think everyone was surprised at how quickly the Taliban retook uh, government in Afghanistan, and uh, and I think most of the assessments were that uh, that the populace didn't oppose, um, and uh, and that there were a lot of people that um, saw. Um, you know, the United States pull out uh, as being that there was no way that the existing government could survive and uh, and they just sort of didn't oppose. Um, one would think that with all of the humanitarian crisis, the poverty, the starvation, the, the females not being allowed to go back to school, etc., that civil society, that the local populace would rise up in opposition. But there doesn't seem to be anything happening. How do you explain all that? And can predictive analytics explain it? Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't think we're there quite yet. I mean, it, it, the, you know, it's a classic black swan, right? What happened in Afghanistan? It's it's uh, what Nassim Taleb, the Lebanese American writer, described, right? It's it's in retrospect, it's it's obvious that it was going to happen. It, it was, you know, the 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 pullout from the Americans was known in advance. The timeline was known, and there had been warning sent. Um, a lot of people knew that, um, that there was just no real sort of resistance on the ground. Um, so it was retrospectively know, knowable, but it took us sort of by by shock. Um, and I, I, in Canada, um, and and I, I I'm one of them. I, you know, I I think a lot of us were just so surprised by the deep uh, connectivity um, between um, you know our nations. So many people uh, that have worked there in different capacities, and of course have fought there and sacrificed their lives. I, um, you know, and and I know this has really affected um, people who have served very profoundly. Um, because, uh, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, they, they've seen that the, the, you know, the, the impact of their work and, and they're, they're obviously concerned about the people there. So I know you don't want to get into politics, uh, but, um, given what happened, was Kretscher right to pull out 10 years ago? Uh, you know, I, I can't answer that question. I, I mean, I, I don't I don't have enough knowledge. I mean, and this is the challenge, right, with all the various topics that we um, that we're tasked with looking at. Right. I, 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 I'm not an expert on any of these humanitarian crises that we um, are, are tasked with measuring around the world um, and certainly not the historical context around them and the decisions and the available data that that was made at that time. Um, what I'm knowledgeable about is simply the importance and frankly, um, the obligation to collect citizen voice data um, at the ground level. Um, we're so used to it, right? In North America, hey, we're, we're not only are we used to polling um, and, and opinion polling, but we're frustrated by it. We, 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 a, lot of, a lot of people have really <laughs> negative attitudes toward it. But in lots of parts of the world, they they haven't heard you know had their voices heard and so it's it's uh, it's getting that voice and channeling that voice to decision makers that uh, th that's that's where we, we we come in. What a fascinating conversation we're having with uh, Neil Seaman uh, tonight. Uh, we're going to take a quick break for some messages and come back more with Neil in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga Nine Sixty. We're chatting about analytics, uh, data analytics, and understanding human behavior and, and uh, human decision-making uh, with Neil Seaman, who is uh, uh, with a company called uh, RIWI. Uh, but I think it sounds like, uh, Neil, you do a lot of uh, work outside of, uh, outside of that company, understanding the brain and what motivates uh, our decision-making, et cetera. And this um, book that you're writing on, on uh, dopamine in the brain sounds quite fascinating. But let me come back to uh, this analytics internationally for a second and understand, are you, are you actually polling or what is it that you're doing? Yeah, thanks, Brian. So we sort of um, reinvented um, uh, polling research or, or market research uh, when we commercialized uh, back in, in 2015. Um, originally, it was incubated in a, in a think tank uh, at the University of Toronto, which I ran. Um, and so what, what we're doing is um, we're, uh, we're, we're pulling opinions from people who are pinged randomly, right? So we used to, John Gallup used to call it sort of mall, mall intercepts when people with clipboards would uh, 
come and, and visit people and ask them their opinion inside malls before they left. What we invented was a, a sort of a global m online mall intercept, right? So randomly um, in, in a non-incented way, uh, when people are, are surfing on the web, uh, they would otherwise call, come to a, a lapsed, dormant, commercially inactive domain. When they're surfing on content, the, the, the link wouldn't work. Um, and it's uh, it, they're introduced uh, with a blank page, no spam alert or anything like that. And they're introduced uh, and offered um, uh, to complete a very short survey, often embossed with the, the the logo of the university that we're working on behalf or the humanitarian organization or the institution. And you say your mission is to improve global prosperity and equity? Yeah. Um, so uh, as a company, we're, we're, we've collected the voices of uh, over 2 billion uh, people uh, since inception. Um, so... And the vision is to become uh, the uh, the global source, the definitive global source of, of trusted uh, data on a wide variety of, of data sources that have high high pedigree um, in the fields of uh, humanitarian assistance, uh, public health, um, and a number of uh, other areas that we focus on. I interviewed a gentleman recently that thought this kind of uh, data collection and mining could actually be a better way to run our democracy. Yeah, it's funny. I, I mean, I, I, part of what drove me to, uh, to create this company is I, Hey, I was a really early investor, uh, in, in the, in the web. A lot of the initiatives that I was driven by were e-democracy initiatives, um, and direct democracy initiatives. Um, democracy is, is challenging and it's fragile. Um, right, and we we need um, uh, we need to whether whether the information online drives decision making or should drive decision making. Um, th that that's a you know question sort of to be left to um, our elected representatives and 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 how we how we de define that. However, um, as a feed, as an information feed, it's absolutely essential. Right, like we're looking at COVID um, protocols right now, and in this context. There's a lot of constituencies that are not represented, and that's my concern, right? So um, you hear a lot about inclusivity uh, these days, and uh, our, our vision, and it comes from public health, is, is to be data inclusive. So, you know, we don't have a, a, a constituency that represents uh, people who take care of their frail elderly um, uh, parents uh, at home. We want their voices. We want the voices of as many people as, as we can. Of course, we're restricted to the internet, but we do have other tools uh, at our, at our uh, availability. One of your other interests, uh, I understand, is mental health stigma. Tell me about that. Yeah, so um, it, it all stems from my, my, my interest in the brain and um, my, my, my parents uh, work in, in brain uh, psychiatry, brain research. And um, what I discovered um, uh, is that stigma is, is the biggest sort of barrier uh, to, um, to change, right? So we've done, uh, we did a, a large study recently on um, attitudes and stigmatic uh, attitudes toward people in recovery um, uh, from drug use, alcohol use in the United States. And, and the stigma is um, you know, extraordinary, right? And recidivism rates um, you know, it are really high. So uh, what, we, what we need to do is we need, first of all, we need to measure it. These stigma towards a, a wide variety of subjects has not been measured. Um, so, uh, so, so when you measure it, you can monitor it and you can improve it. Um, so in the context of mental health, that's really important. We did a large initiative with um, an organization I'm associated with called the Investigative Journalism Bureau at the Dell Atlanta School of Public Health, um, where we measured stigma um, on campus and a variety of uh, mental health conditions on university campuses across North America. And we, we found the same thing, right? So um, if we can fight stigma, if we can talk about a variety of issues openly, we give agency, we give autonomy um, to people. Um, suffering from a, a wide range of, of, of conditions. So once you take away the stigma, then they'll actually uh, search out solutions to their challenges. Is that the argument? Yeah, and you normalize the um, the 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 importance of, of reaching out, right? Reaching out for help, um, helping your 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 neighbor. Um, 
understanding the concerns um, uh, that that people have, and and not not making judgments uh, really quickly, right? Um, that 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 is a big challenge for us humans. We <laughs> we tend to be a self assured lot, right? So when it comes to predictions about the next course of COVID, right, or whether it comes to what we think that that person you know, that I used to box with would do next or, um, or, or the attitudes and inclinations of someone who's, um, been, been, been fighting, um, uh, uh the, the strains of, of addiction, we make assumptions. And so what we need to do is, is be aware, uh, of stigma. And, and then when we're, we're more self-aware, we can check those impulses and we can, um, can be kinder to people. Fascinating. Um, you also talk about big data in healthcare. How does big data help us in healthcare? So it was overhyped, right? And I, I confess, I was one of the overhypers. <laughs> so we thought in the early days, um, we, I mean, lots of organizations, Google, others, right? We, we thought that, um, that this avalanche of data would be able to micro detect and predict uh, a wide variety of illness uh, diseases um, and replace the, you know, replace the cardiologist, for example. Um, I don't know if we're we're not there yet, certainly, but where where we are is um, we we can help with big data in terms of um, helping people keep to their medication regimen, right? Um, being aware of whether uh, people uh, have taken their meds and and when's the best time to remind them to take their meds. Um, so these are the sorts of things that can be uh, incredibly powerful to um, reducing uh, morbidity and mortality. I got to ask you about another one that you've got on your uh, on your U of T website, post-partisanship and brokered dialogue. What the heck is post-partisanship and brokered dialogue? So, bro, thanks. Brokered, uh, brokered dialogue is a phrase that my friend Jim Lavery at Emory University um, uses. Uh, Janet Parsons at U of T uses that word. So that was relatively new to me. Um, uh, post-partisanship is a phrase that Governor Schwarzenegger in California, um, former Mayor Bloomberg used a lot. I, I mean, it, it's sort of this idea where we, we move away from partisanship and we agree on a common goal. And it's, it's kind of like deliberative democracy, right? You, you agree on a common goal and decision-making tools um, to, uh, to find a solution. And the irony, right? One of the ironies is that um, for a long time, for many decades, um, public health was actually the field in which there would be the most postpartisanship, right? Um, where, where people across the political spectrum were a very, very supportive of um, public health initiatives. And now it's become acrimonious and heavily political. Why? Because of this uh, dopamine uh, aspect that you talked about where we want to believe what we used to believe? I think that's part of it. I, I mean, and I think, you know, part of it is we, we, we don't, we don't quite know yet. Um, you know, I, I, I think that um, we're, we're, we're getting there. Um, we're going to get there. I, I think actually we're kind of at a turning point right now where most people, most cogent people know they were wrong about at least one thing with respect to COVID, right? And so when you know you were wrong, um, you know, I, I know clinicians at some of the most sophisticated, advanced academic institutions that were wrong and they admit they were wrong about certain courses and events and regimens during this pandemic. And I think when you have that humility um, and that's what we have now, I think you're much, much stronger. We know this in warfare, we know this in a variety of different areas. When you have humility, uh, you suffered loss. Um, you can you can focus on the enemy better. Um, so I think we've reached a turning point. I think we're going to be less partisan this year and more postpartisan. Well, I hope you're right in that regard. I I, I agree with you that humility is a, is an, a very important uh, um, value, um, personality trait, whatever you want to call it, to, to have. I don't think a lot of people have it, and so I hope you're right in that regard. Um, you know, I just uh, after uh, Ford's announcement of uh, some of the restrictions. Uh, of, of, of late, um, I've heard so many dissenting voices, which I've been surprised by. You see these, uh, these statistics of, uh, of what's happening. Um, I would have thought people would have almost expected for it to, to come out uh, with what he's come out with, but I've heard so many people complaining about it, uh, the impact on small business, et cetera, which I think is valid uh, from an impact, but 
but we had to do it. Um, and uh, I think, and yet I see more dissent. And so I don't know if you're right. I hope you're right, but I'm not sure about it. Yeah, I mean, I'm I, I'm inclined to optimism bias, like us all, right? I mean, I, I that's one of the biases I'm I'm well aware of, and and actually, optimism bias can be really pernicious, right? I mean, Daniel Kahneman and the late Amos Tversky actually said it can be some of the worst bias. Um, but but um, here I I I am seeing um, optimism. I mean, I I see it on the premier's face. I mean, um, I, I see it. In so many um, public-facing individuals, I, I do I do see them sort of say, "Hey, look, I got that wrong." I do see more courageous authenticity and leadership. Um, yeah, which which has been which has been a lack, right? We, we, we've suffered for a lack of that in, in large parts uh, of the world. Um, but I'm seeing more of that, and that's what gives me that that's what gives me that that hope and optimism. That's an interesting term, courageous authenticity. What? I didn't invent it. <laughs> what is who invented? It? I haven't. Heard that you know, I I don't know. I took a leadership training course, uh, which I loved, uh, and uh, for a few years, I'm a big fan of leadership training. And uh, there's there's different sort of uh, frameworks uh, for what makes a great leader. Uh, and I've always been of the view that courageous authenticity is is the right way to go. Right? Courageous so, authenticity so, sounds good. To yeah, me. just straight up, candid with the facts. Right. And uh, and you lay it out there um, and you just focus on what is real. OK, so one of the big questions about uh, leadership, authentic or otherwise, I think facing sort of us this week is uh, what happened a year ago, January 6th in the United States. Um, how do you explain that with uh, your predictive analytics? Should people have known that was going to happen? Um, and what does it say about our our non-post-partisanship. Yeah, I mean that was that was an extreme, right? Um, that was um, that stunned uh, stunned me. I mean, as a as an observer, I think it it, it stunned uh, the vast majority of, of Republicans um, and uh, and ardent supporters of the of uh, former President Trump. Um, I, I, I think it. It, it speaks to a, a radical um, edge uh, and, and discord uh, that does not represent, um, you know, most people. Um, there, there was a, a wonderful book called The Irony of Small Things. Um, Jedediah Purdy, I think, was the author. And, and uh, he just, you know, he just talked about the reality that um, the vast majority of people, right, were, were in the middle. Like, I mean, the voices that are public and loud are angry and dissonant, but, you know, most of us are, are pretty reasonable. And, you know, when presented with the data in, in a coherent collaborative framework, um, it, it's, uh, you know, we come to the right decisions, or at least we can agree on the process. Um, you know, I, I think we, we are residing in these echo chambers. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm not, I don't want to blame social media for everything. I actually think there's a lot of good that comes from some social media some of the time, as long as you're careful about it. But I, I, I do believe that we are retreating into these, uh, into these chambers and we need to be um, more accepting of, uh, of different types of people, right? Spirited dinner parties. Do you remember those? Um, yes. They used to exist. <laughs> <laughs> where we had spirited debates and, and then we all left as friends afterwards. I got to tell you, I would love to have a spirited dinner party with you, Neil Seaman. Like you are a fascinating gentleman. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back with some concluding comments with Neil Seaman in just a minute. Stay with us. What a fascinating conversation tonight with Neil Seaman about um, data analytics, about big data, about, uh, about dopamine, about the brain. Um, and uh, Neil, I understand one of the other things that you're interested in is investigative journalism. Tell me why you're interested in that and what are you doing? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I've always been a, a, a fan of great uh, long form investigative journalism. And uh, like many, I, I, I've seen the demise of that. We, we, there's, there's not a lot of funding in newsrooms for that. And so joint forces, our company did, and I did it personally as a mentor, as a philanthropist, uh, to the investigative journalism at the University of Toronto, associated with the Dal Alana School of Public Health. And what we do is we get a real diverse array of graduate students, undergraduate students, um, to investigate uh, 
public health challenges um, that we don't know anything about. And uh, teamed up with the, with Torstar Corporation, um, uh, 11 universities, schools of journalism across North America. Um, we first lurk, looked at uh, mental health on campus across North America. We're looking at the opioid issue. We're looking at uh, uh, ransomware, cyberware issues. Um, we're, we're looking at, uh, you know, stories untold. Um, and we're bringing to, to, to bear data. Um, a lot of the future of long-form journalism, in my view, is going to be informed by data, data visualization, um, visual stories, storytelling online. And so it's a really exciting, uh, eclectic uh, group of, of smart, creative people. I think it's an absolute gem at the University of Toronto. I'm really honored to be part of it. Fantastic. Um, what's the future of, uh, of data analytics? Uh, Fareed Zakari did a show on China um, I'm not sure if you caught it, but it was really quite interesting. And what it uh, suggested is that uh, some of the sort of Orwellian beliefs of monitoring have actually taken place in China today, where, um, you know, everything that you do, everything you say, everywhere you go is being monitored. Is that the future of, of, of data analytics? No, um, that, that, that may be the future of, uh, of data analytics in the, in the PRC, the People's Republic of China. But um, in, in the Western world, I, I, you know, I've been a privacy samurai uh, you know, for a long time. I've really believed in uh, the importance of data ethics and, and, and data privacy. I think they're, they're, and we're seeing this, they're taking on um, a, a new legitimacy now. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> we're at the very, very early stages of this. But if you look at the younger generations, right, if you look at the 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 millennials and younger, they're they're very careful, much more careful about um, their their digital hygiene, whom they associate with and interact with online. And I think that's going to be a bigger part of consumer behavior, citizen behavior, and and we're going to demand that of, of governments. Um, look, we, we it's it's taken us a long time to become uh, data literate in this regard, and and uh, the commercial web has only been around since the mid '90s, right? So. Um, we're, we're, we're beginning that journey now. Um, so the future of data analytics is uh, definitely more data, uh, data that's curated, understandable, elegantly organized, um, where uh, the, the rotten stuff um, gets, gets weeded out. How do we get more spirited dinner parties on the internet? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, I, hey, I, I, part of it is what you do. I mean, this is it, right? Like, I mean, um, I, it's uh, the, the internet at the end of the day is just enabler. It's, it's just it's just a tool uh, through which to communicate, and we're 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 doing that now. And I I, I think um, you do it through market forces. There's a real demand and appetite for spirited discussion, spirited debate, um, online, offline. People are hungry for it. I think more so than ever before. Um, and so I think naturally we're, we're just going to pull away from these really divisive um, social platforms and other entities that that uh, pull on our dopamine transmitters and, and make us, uh, let's just say, more um, more hardened in our in our ideologies. That's the most optimistic thing you said. I really appreciate it. And on that one, I really hope you're right. Neil Seaman, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Brian. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, I wish you and your loved ones good health and, uh, and your listeners, everyone listening. Um, I wish you well during this uh, tumultuous, challenging time. Thank you. That's our show for tonight. Thanks so much, everybody. Good night.